Perfect. It's my first foray into You're pastraming. You're born natural. <laughs> you should now open up your own barbecue <laughs> opal shop. Uh, that's okay, that hashtag goes. goals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Guillermo, senior video producer for Chow Hunt. My love for Opal knows no limit. That's why today I'm in the East Village of Manhattan. I'm gonna visit the Eddie and Chef Jeremy Salomon, who's gonna teach me how to make pastrami beef chong. Jeremy is one of the youngest executive chefs that I know, changing the menu from the Eddie completely to a mostly Hungarian menu inspired by his grandma's recipes. Opal is a staple of Eastern European cuisine, so it made total sense to ask Jeremy to teach me how to make this delicious chong dish. This is just one of the highlights out of his spectacular menu. Okay, so walk me through the process. First step, second step, how does this happen? So we get the tongue in, and then we brine it in a, uh, in a wet cure of salt and sugar, aromatics, and we let that brine for about four days. Then we take it out, softly simmer it for about four hours until it's nice and tender, and we can peel the skin off, portion it, uh, we crust it in our pastrami crust, and then we smoke it for about three to four hours, depending on the size, and then we plate it up. If I wanted to pastrami something and smoke it in my house, are there options for that, or? Uh, as long as you have a great, uh, you know, fire extinguisher at the ready, um, then I think you'll be fine. Like a, uh, a box, uh, box smoker on your stove, you just have to burn um, your, your your chips, your wood chips beforehand, and then cover it. Um, so it's kind of like a makeshift okay, uh, gotcha. smoker. There's definitely there's options. options. Okay. And there's also home smokers that I'm sure are at different kitchen stores. Once it's smoked, it's ready to eat. We slice it and we serve it with uh, some sour cream. Uh, we've also done uh, labne, which is like a Turkish uh, yogurt cheese. We finish it with lots of pickled radishes and a parsley salad. Yeah, delicious. Yeah. How long have you been working here? So I've been working at the Eddy for five years. Mm -hmm. I started out as a line cook, uh, then became a sous chef tried escaping, and then I came back as the executive chef. I understand that the menu changed once you became the executive chef. Mm -hmm. What did you do to the menu? So I brought some of my uh, heritage, my, my family's uh, culture and heritage here, which is uh, Hungarian, Eastern European. When did you first like think, oh, I love this, I want to cook, or? Yeah, I think I told my mother when I was nine, I was on my way home from school, she was driving me home, and I just said to her, I'm gonna be a chef one day. The, I say the three women in my life, my mother and my two grandmothers cook, uh, and watching them kind of almost have this superpower of bringing everyone together. It's like everyone in the family could have been really PO'd at each other, right. and everyone could have been in a, in a tiff or a fight. Um, but it was like as soon as mom or one of my grandmothers was like dinner, it was like everyone just like ran to the table and everyone just kind of forgot for... And know, everything's okay stuff. now. Yeah, and everything was okay and maybe I wanted some of that like power. My first kitchen job was like at 11 years old. Oh. Will you tell me a little bit about the structure of the tongue? And sure, how yeah. How familiar you've gotten with it? So, um, yes, I've, I'm, I'm very intimate with, with tongue. Um, <laughs> so, tongue is actually super high in fat and cholesterol, so it's really healthy for you. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the root right here, and this, this back part is all connected to like blood vessels and the windpipe. Once it's boiled, uh, what we would normally do is we take like a small paring knife or a petty knife, and we'll just make an incision down the middle of it, mm -hmm. and then we'll open it up. Um, right. And at that point, after the boiling process, this will be soft enough that you can just like... Exactly, yeah. It's a little tedious, especially when you have like 10 of them. Uh, of it's a lot of work. And here, this is our pastrami crust, our caraway, cumin, fennel, coriander, and then our black pe uh, peppercorns we're gonna add in at the very end, because uh, we really don't need to toast those. So traditionally, so pastrami is actually of Romanian origin. Mm -hmm. um, the Romanian Jews, when they came here, they typically made pastrami with goose. And then when they came to they came to the States, they realized that goose was really expensive. So they converted to beef tongue. So that is kind of the origin of pastrami. Oh, wow. Um, and 
pastrami, the first, I believe it's pastra. I'm not Romanian, so I'm probably going to get a lot of Romanian people <laughs> hating on me. Uh, but I think it's like pastra is actually means to preserve or conserve something, which is what we're essentially doing with pastrami. Yeah. All right, so we have our toasted uh, spices. I'm gonna go ahead and put them into our blender. Now, if you have a spice grinder, or even at home, if you have a coffee grinder, this That'll will work. work. Yeah, totally. And then it'll perfume the kitchen and everything will smell really fabulous. Mm -hmm. So the crust is, it's there for texture and flavor. Also, it does help seal everything in, but really the, the process of, of grinding it and smoking it is really where the preservation comes to gotcha. It's already peeled uh, and it's ready to be crusted. Go ahead, so just put it right into the bowl. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to do is just kind of like pack all the crust yep, on all the sides. Yep. Okay. Give it a little spice bath. Mm -hmm. And now she's ready to go into the smoker. Let's take her. This is our little engine that could. We've had her for a very long time. Um, it's an electric smoker. It's an electric smoker, yeah. Uh, and right now we're using uh, hickory chips uh, is, to fuel it. This? Yeah. So we, we soak the chips for about uh, 24 hours um, just so they get um, nice and wet. And so when they go into the uh, when they go into the smoker itself, they help produce uh, steam and they don't like catch on fire. Mm -hmm. That'll go for about three to four hours, and what we'll do is probably reintroduce uh, the chips to it about like every, I'd say like every hour, maybe a little over every hour. Um, we'll add some new wet chips uh, to help produce more smoke, mm -hmm. um, and then towards the final hour, so towards that like third, fourth hour, we'll stop adding chips to it just so it all kind of and dies down it. and just let it go. It'll kind of just like air smoke and that all that smoke will just kind of like start clinging to the uh, the actual tongue. When I was like 11, I never thought about sexuality, uh, but it was, you know, being in a male dominated environment, especially like that straight male kind of like very military, very like either be here or don't or, you know, just yelling, screaming. Mm -hmm cursing like super loud and calling each other uh, names that just like were completely not necessary. At that time, I would always stop and think to myself, okay, that's not the chef that I'm gonna be. So it wasn't even a matter of like, of being a queer, a queer or, you know, LGBT. It was just came from a place of like, that's not how this industry or any industry should it function. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you know, when I, when I discovered my sexuality and, and, and who I was, then it kind of like the two overlapped and I would hear things like, you know, you know anyways, I, I'm not gonna go through. And there was also this stigma of like, that only men are allowed to be the ones cooking professionally, which is like super ironic, yep. <laughs> given, given the history of, of, of females in the kitchen, that, that just never made sense to me. All these factors came into play, and I knew that when I took over the kitchen one day, I wanted to be I wanted to be open and accepting and all inclusive, um, and that made sure that everyone felt equal. You know, I think the industry is definitely moving in the right direction. There's a lot of work to be done for yeah. sure, but we're here. We're talking about about this and this topic, and I that think means that we are that we're, we're getting forward. somewhere. So. Yeah. Last question before I actually go into this. Um, is there a way to eat this? Do you recommend? Just make sure you get some of all those different components that we had talked about. So get some of the lobna underneath, get pickled radish. Go for it, go to town. Mm. For some, I'm trying pastrami pong. Yes. Tastes like pastrami. The smokiness is great. Mm. It plays really well with the spices. It maybe tones them down a little bit. Because mm -hmm. it does have a sweetness and a fattiness to it. So yeah. that's playing in there. Um, the tanginess of the lamne and the, um, even the little bit of brine that you added from the radishes, that plays really well with it. The textural uh, play between the crust, mm -hmm. the crunchy crust and the tenderness of the meat inside. Mm -hmm. 